Hey man, good, ma- good morning, family. Good morning. Man, I-, I like that song. Come on. I-, I, like the- I like the little twist that Michael put in there with the someday. Okay, Michael. <laughs> Give me fired up to preach the word of God this morning. Amen. Are you guys fired up to hear the word this morning? Yeah. I said, are you fired up to hear the word this morning? Yeah. You know, anytime the word is preached, your soul should be refreshed. Because the Bible says the word of God is refreshment to our souls. Before we get into this, let's, uh, let's go ahead and bow our heads for prayer. Our Father, we come before you so humbled that you have chosen us. That you have chosen us to be your, your rightful heirs and to receive an inheritance in heaven. God, we are so grateful that you sent your son to die on the cross for us. That we may have an intimate relationship with you. God, we are so grateful that you are sovereign over our lives, that you have the the perfect plan to prosper us and not to harm us. God, we are so grateful for your protection, for your deep love, and for your humility to come down and serve us in such a way. God, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, I really want to encourage the church that, you know, I am just so proud of each and every one of you. Uh, I'm so proud that each and every one of you has, has stood up for the truth, but not only for the truth, but for God's righteousness. And I believe that when we stand up for the truth of God and his righteousness out of love, God will bless us tremendously. I have a question for you this morning. And that question is, how many of you guys have a plan for your life? Go ahead, raise your hand. Who has a plan for you? Okay. Now, Who here has a a five-year plan for their life? Okay, okay, we got some planners, we got some visionaries. You know, when when I think of this, I'm like, man, all of us have plans to do great things in our life. And and I I can remember a time for me where I had my little five-year plan back when I was in high school. And I remember uh, my plan, and once I got into high school, was to take my advanced placement courses and honors courses and, and, uh, and, and ball out in my athletics and perform the way I needed to do to get a scholarship to my dream college, which was UC Davis. And uh, I had all this vision, all these plans for my life. And I, and I remember I, I was really successful in them. I, I, you know, I did well in my courses. I had a high GPA. Um, I did well in football and, and track and all these things. And, and I was getting offers and, and being looked at my senior year. And I remember the, the only school that I wanted to go to was UC Davis. And that was my dream school. And they were D1 in football. And, um, I, you know, I love football, but I was going there for my career. I was going there to be a vet. I was so debating if I was going to be a vet or a zoologist because I really loved animals. And I remember, you know, my coach is sending in my film, doing great in my grades. I worked so, so hard. And I remember uh, having some phone calls with the, the scout uh, that, that was uh, recruiting me. And we were talking and, like, we're going to offer you the scholarship and you're our number one pick for a running back and, like, all these things. And I'm just like, wow, all this hard work is paying off. But then I took my, my SAT score, or my SAT test. Because they said, okay, we need you to take your SAT test, and you need to hit this, uh, this, this you know, um, point uh, percentage, right? And so I'm like, okay, good. I studied, and I went after it, and, and I took my test, and the results came back, and, and the, the results weren't high enough to get into UC Davis. Though I had honors and AP courses, though I had a high GPA 3.8, they were looking strictly at my SAT scores. And I remember the coaches were trying to to pull plugs and try to see, okay, how can we get this guy into this school? And I remember receiving the call saying, hey, you know, we we really, really want you to come to UC Davis, but we, we just can't get you in because of the test scores. He's like, but what I want you to do is I want you to go play for a junior college, play there, and then we can revisit because you'll be taking courses there, you know, getting your associates and whatnot, and it'll be be easier for you to transfer over. And I'm like, okay, cool. So I went there, and and I went to Fullerton College, 
And during this time, I was so depressed. I was so discouraged because I had, I had a bright future ahead of me. I, I had worked so hard, and my plans were, were lined up to do what I wanted to do. And at that time, I became bitter at God. I became, you know, depressed and, and angry. Like, God, I, I worked so hard for this. How could you not let me get into my dream school? But little did I know, God had a plan. And I remember going to Fullerton College, and I got reached out to by four disciples. And it took four disciples for me to become a disciple. But I remember when I, was, when I went there to play football, I, I received so much injury. I tore my PCL on my knee. I tore my hamstring, and I tore uh, a, ligament, a ligament in my shoulder. And I was sitting there just like, God, like, this is my dream. I, is this my second chance? What are you doing? And when I started to see all these things, I began to understand that God was working in a way which I did not see. And I became a disciple of Jesus Christ in 2011, amen? And, and I share that because I think that sometimes we have a plan and we think it's good, and that we think because it's good that it should happen. But that's not always the case with God. Turn with me in your Holy Scriptures to Jeremiah chapter 29. In Jeremiah chapter 29, we'll pick it up in verse 11. This is a, a great passage that we always read in the Seeking God study. And it says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and, I, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. Right here, Jeremiah sends this, this letter to God's people. He preaches it to them saying, hey, God has plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Now when I think of this, I always think of, man, I have all these plans for my life and yet God's plans are better than mine. But we look at this passage and people are always inspired by it because they're just like, yes, God has great plans for me. He's going to do this. He's going to do that. But as you read, there's a couple things you have to do to make sure that God has these plans to prosper in you, and that is to seek him with all of your heart and pray to him that he may bring you back from captivity. Because the Israelites at this point were banished from God's presence because of their sin. But when I think of God's ultimate plan, I think of his plan to get us all to heaven. And so God orchestrates all that has happened in our life to try to get us to understand his will and his sovereignty. When I think of God's plan, I think of him looking down and saying, Aaron, hmm, how can I get this man to heaven? Because he's a jacked up dude. He's sinful, he's prideful, he's all these things, but I love him. But what must I do? What plan must I orchestrate to get him to heaven? And in the same way, God is looking down at each and every one of us this morning, and he has a perfect plan for each and every one of us. Go ahead and turn to your neighbor and say, God's got a perfect plan for you. And because God has a perfect plan for us, that is the title of my lesson this morning, is God's perfect plan. Turn me to Genesis chapter 39. We're going to take it back old school, amen? amen. Go back to the beginning. And point number one is keep your integrity because in the midst of God's plan, whether you know it already or whether you're trying to figure out what that is, one thing you must do is you got to keep your inte integrity right here. In Genesis 39, we're going to pick up in verse 6. Now, if you guys know a little bit about Joseph, Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers who didn't like him, who were, who, who were jealous of him, because he definitely was the favorite son of, the, of his father. And at this point, as 
Jacob is sold into slavery, he is then bought by Potiphar, as we'll pick it up right here in verse 6. It says, So he left in Joseph's care everything he had with Joseph in charge. He did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now Joseph was well built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, Come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, My master does not concern myself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has not withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked and sinful thing against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even with her. One day he went into the house to attend his duties, and none of the household servants was there. She caught him by his cloak and said, come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. When she saw that he had left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house, she called her household servants. Look, she said to them, this Hebrew has been brought to us to make sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. When he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. Now what we see here is God blessed Joseph in a great way. Though he was sold into slavery, by, and, and Potiphar bought him, Potiphar saw his talent. Potiphar was able to see the kind of man Joseph was. And because of it, he put Joseph in charge of everything that he owned, his household and all these things. And yet the Bible shows us that Joseph was a good-looking dude, that he was like handsome. He even said he was well-built, so he must have well, he had some broad shoulders. He must have been muscular. He must have had some biceps, like whatever. The Bible says he was handsome. And because of this, Potiphar's wife took interest in him. But what we see here from Joseph is his spiritual integrity. That, he, that in the midst of it, when, he, when she's trying to, to get at him, what does he say? How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? You know, Joseph was in Potiphar's house either 11 years or less. So imagine Joseph being in this house for this many years and, his, and Potiphar's wife constantly hitting on him. And I'm sure she was a beautiful woman. The temptation, how many of us would have resisted the temptation for more than 10 years? Would your spiritual integrity to God, would it have been proven trustworthy? You know, the, the, the other reason why I think Joseph not only denied himself, but, but said how wicked this was, was because he understood what he was going to lose if he gave into immorality with, this, with his master's wife. He knew that he could have lost everything. He could have lost his relationship with God, and yet he could have lost all that God had used him to do in Potiphar's house to be successful. But you know what's interesting is that even though he had this spiritual integrity, he still lost it all. He, Potiphar finds out and he, and he throws him into prison. But you know what's interesting that the world teaches us that, hey, that's normal to do. That, that, that's normal to, to be hit on and, and yeah, just go ahead, just, just, just be with this woman. That, that's, that's how warped the world is. And what we understand from Joseph is that he understood the values of God. And because he understood the values of God, he cherished it in his life. But the other thing that we can learn from Joseph's story is that though God had prospered him in a great way and made him very successful, he could have been like, you know what? I'm doing pretty good right now. Okay, let's do this. Potiphar's not going to find out. We can keep this on the DL. 
no one has to know what we're doing at all, and I'll keep everything, and I'm going to be good to go. But that was not Joseph's heart. You see, prosperity at times and success will test your character. It will test your integrity, and it, and it, it will even test it more so than hardship. When we go through hardship, we think like, oh my goodness, I feel like giving up. Man, you better be grateful for that hardship because you might not be able to stay faithful with some success in your life. But when I, when, when I looked at the word integrity, I found this out about integrity. The, the word in itself stems from the Latin, which actually means whole and complete. Now, what does that mean? Well, this requires an inner sense of wholeness and consistency of your character. So people should visibly be able to see what kind of person you are on the daily. Because it's what your character continuously shows every single day of your life. You don't leave parts of yourself at work. You, you, you don't leave parts of yourself in, in the social atmosphere. You are who you are through the scriptures. And how dare we try to hide who we really are in our character and not uphold it through the scriptures. But you know what I like in verse 19, later on through the, the passage, that what Joseph did, he, he, he probably was very tempted, and yet when she grabbed his cloak, what did she do? What did he do? He booked it. He said, bye. Bye, girl. I'm out. My girl, I know, not me. I will not commit this wicked sin. And he probably ran out there like a track athlete. And the garment he had on, I don't know how loose that was. Maybe he ran out in his underwear like, oh my goodness, people are going to ask me questions. Hey, I'm sorry, I ran away from sin. Right. You got to do what you got to do, amen? <laughs> but sometimes, even though you do good in God's sight, you feel like sometimes it's not rewarded. And I'm sure Joseph could have been like, God, how could you do this? I stood up for righteousness. I stood against temptation, and yet I, I still lost everything. But he had one thing, which was his relationship with God. Yeah. I think for us this morning, church, we got to learn the art of delayed gratification. When, when you don't see the plan of God, and, and it doesn't please you right at that moment, you can't give in to sin. Come on, Aaron. You can't give in to what the world is feeding you. And sometimes we just don't enjoy God's plan. Yeah, but we got to remember that in Jeremiah 29, he says, I have plans to prosper you, not to hurt you. He has plans to build your life up, to get you to heaven. And if that means you need some hardship in your night, life, you better obey the word of God. Amen. But in the midst of God's perfect plan, not only do you got to keep your integrity, but you got to stay God dependent. Turn me to Genesis chapter 41. Now, a little background. As Joseph was put into prison, he, he immediately gets blessed by God and he wins the favor of those in charge of the prison to be in charge of the prisoners. And so... Again, God is just like, just working and just showing Joseph, hey, be calm. I got your back still. And in the midst of him being in prison, he's able to meet the chief baker and the chief armor uh, cupbearer of the Pharaoh, who got thrown into the prison for, for whatever reason. And he's able to meet them and interpret their dreams that pretty, pretty much like scared them. And as he interprets his, these dreams... They get out to the Pharaoh when he has his two crazy dreams. Let's pick it up in Genesis chapter 41. And uh, let's, let's go ahead and jump to verse 14. So Pharaoh, he hears what, what Joseph can do. And Joseph comes to him and explains these visions. Because the cupbearer finally comes back after forgetting Joseph in two years. Hey, don't forget about me. Tell the Pharaoh who I am. But he forgot. And now he's locked up for another two years. But look at God's work right here. In verse 14. So Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and he was quickly brought from the dungeon. When he had shaved and changed his clothes, 
he came before Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream and no one can interpret it. But have I, but I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. I cannot do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh. He's so humble. But God, God will give you, Pharaoh, the answer he desires. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, In my dream, I was standing on the bank of the Nile River. When out of the river there came up seven cows, fat and sleek, and they gazed among the reeds. After them, seven other cows came up, scrawny and very ugly and lean. I, had never been, I have never seen such an ugly cow in all the land of Egypt. The lean, ugly cows ate up the seven fat cows that came up first. But even after they ate them, no one could tell that they had done so. They looked just as ugly as before. Then I woke up. Let's jump down to verse 37. The plan seemed good to Pharaoh. Actually, I'm sorry. Pick it up in verse 33. And now let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land. Let Pharaoh appoint commissioners over the land to take a fifth of the harvest of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. They should collect all the food of these good years that are coming and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in their cities for food. This food should be held in reserve for the country to be used during the seven years of famine that will come upon Egypt so that the country may not be ruined by the famine. The plan seemed good to Pharaoh and to all his officials. So Pharaoh asked them, can we find anyone like this man? One in whom is the spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and so wise. You shall be in charge of my palace and all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. Is this not an amazing passage? You know, Joseph was locked up for two full years, was forgotten. And I believe that Joseph probably was discouraged at certain points in his walk with God. But nevertheless, we see that in verse 16, that Joseph was God dependent. Well, how do we know that? As they call him to, to interpret this dream, he, he basically says, Pharaoh, I can't do this, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. See, Joseph could have been like, hey, yeah, I can interpret dreams. Let me do that for you. But he shows his dependency on God throughout all his struggles. You know, you got to trust God and not your circumstance. And that's what was really big about Joseph is that even though he went through all these circumstances that looked really horrible, he trusted in God first and foremost. You know, what I've learned is that few are willing to endure the greatness of God's great preparation. And little do we know that God is in the works. He's in the back scenes trying to make you great. He's in the back scenes trying to make sure that you have the best life a life to the full. But if we lose faith, if we give in to our circumstances, then we will never be able to see the fullness of God's plan. Yeah. You know what? I'm reminded of uh, the movie Karate Kid. How many guys have seen the Karate Kid? Yeah. Not the one with Jaden Smith. That one was, that one was whack. Now, I'm sorry. That one, that one, I mean, I like Jaden Smith, but man, that, when you look at the 1984 one, that just blew it out the park. I mean, I love Jackie Chan, too. I'm a big Jackie, Jackie fan, J Jackie Chan fan, amen. But, I mean, no one has anything on Mr. Miyagi. And I, I like the, the, throughout the movie how, you know, Daniel's son is, is getting beat up. He's getting bullied uh, by these, these, these kids in Cobra Kai. And he meets uh, Mr. Miyagi because he's over there trying to learn karate off the television. Like, and if you ain't got a teacher to learn karate, you ain't going to learn the technique. And so Mr. Miyagi finally sees that he was getting beat up so much that he offers to teach him karate. And so they start, he's like, I'm going to train you. Come tomorrow. They start training. And Mr. Miyagi picks him to work. He has him waxing the floor. He has him painting, you know, his fence. He has him doing all these things. And, and Daniel's son is just getting ticked off. And, and the scene that I really appreciate so much is where he just goes off on Mr. Miyagi. He's like, 
You told me you were going to teach me karate, but you had me painting and doing all this stuff. Like, I'm sick of it. And Mr. Miyagi, he, like, he storms off. He runs away. And then Mr. Miyagi says, Daniel son. <laughs> like, and when I left, I was like, ooh, that would have that would have scared me too. Because he's like, Daniel son. This, you know, this mini little, you know, Chinese dude. And, and, and Daniel son comes back to him. And he says, he says, uh, uh, paint. He's like, do this, paint. And he's, and Daniel son bends down. And he's like, okay, I'll show you how to paint. He's like, no, paint. And he's going through all the motions, and then Mr. Miyagi starts punching, and he's like, woof, woof, woof. And then Danielson's like, whoa, what am I doing? But he did not see, he did not trust Mr. Miyagi and what he was trying to teach him, which was the core principles of karate. And Danielson, he couldn't see the training which would lead him to become the champion of that karate championship that he played in. But you know, I, I thought about that and I was like, man, all people God uses greatly, but he first prepares you greatly. And I want to, I want to challenge us this morning that if you feel like, man, you don't understand the plan of God or you see it and you do, but you have some trials and you have some tribulations and you're, and you're struggling with sin and you're, and, you're, and you're trying to do the best thing for God, hold on tight because God is preparing you for something great. Come on, bro. And when you think about God's plan, it's not always glory. It's not always prestige. And in Genesis 39, 21, I, I really want to read this to you. It says, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and grant, granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. And what this shows is that in the midst of God's plan, he was, he was with Joseph the whole time. And I believe sometimes as disciples, we can forget that God is with you. We can, forget, we, we can feel like, man, I feel lonely that no one's with me. and I'm going through this. I'm going through that. But God is right behind you. He never left Joseph. In fact, he showed Joseph that he was there by the little, the little things, the little blessings that he gave him. To reassure him that I am with you. Turn me to Genesis chapter 49. You know, at the end of, of the story, Joseph's father, Jacob, honors and recognizes Joseph's perseverance in God's plan. In Genesis 49, verse 23. It says, in 22, Joseph is a fruitful vine, a fruitful vine near a spring, whose branches climb over a wall. With bitterness, archers attacked him. They shot at him with hostility, but his bow remained steady. His strong arms stayed limber because of the hand of the mighty one of Jacob, because of the shepherd, the rock of Israel. Because of your father's God who helps you, because of the Almighty who blesses you with blessings of the heavens above, blessings of the deep that lies below. And, and Jacob right here, he acknowledges his son's perseverance and his dependence on God. And you know, some, when you look at Joseph's life, it didn't work out and plan out the way he probably thought it would. And it never will. Like I said, when I started off, I thought this was going to be my plan for my life. And yet God just said, nope, redirected me and put me on a better plan that I could never imagine of being on. And I truly believe that even in my own life that if God did not orchestrate what he did, when he, if he did not block me from going to UC Davis, I believe I would have never became a disciple. I believe, honestly, I would have become an atheist. And I would not be an evangelist. I would not be married to my beautiful wife, Sheila. I would not have an incredible family like this. And I would have not been forgiven of my sins if I didn't accept and embrace the truth of salvation. You know, there's a, there's a model that too many Christians say. And it, it's a model that says... These things are always against me. And I want to challenge you. Get that model out of your heart. Get that model out of your mind that, that there's always something against you. It's okay because God has your back. Turn me to Genesis chapter 45. 
Point number three, watch God's plan unfold. In Genesis chapter 45, in verse 5. Let's pick it up in verse 4. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. Now this is after all that has happened. His brothers come into Egypt. Joseph reveals his identity. And he says, when they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now, do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here. Because it was to save lives that God sent me here ahead of you. For two years now, there has been famine in the land. And for the next five years, there will not be plowing and reaping. But God sent me here ahead of you to pers pr preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household and ruler of all of Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me and don't delay. This passage inspires me because now you, you are able to see why Joseph went through all those challenging things. It was to prepare his heart. But it was ultimately a greater plan that he had yet to see, which was what? To be the deliverance of the land. To make sure that people would be saved from, from famine, but also that his family would be saved. And Joseph right here, he paints the big picture of what God intended for his life. But I really want to really go through Joseph's timeline. Because I really want you to understand how perfect God's plan is. So that you can understand today how perfect the plan he has for you. You see, if Joseph was never sold into slavery, then Joseph would have never gone to Egypt. And if Joseph never gone to Egypt, he would have never encountered Potiphar's wife, who then he would allow him to go into prison, that would then he would be able to meet the chief baker and the chief cupbearer. And if he would have never met them, he would have never interpreted their dreams. If he never interpreted their dreams, then they would have never, the, the cupbearer would have never went to Pharaoh and said, hey, I know who can interpret your dream because he interpreted my dream and it actually came true. And if the Pharaoh never heard that, then Joseph would have stayed in prison. And if Joseph would have stayed in prison, he would have never been the right hand of Pharaoh. And if he was never the right hand of Pharaoh, then he would have never been able to prepare the land for the famine. And if he wasn't able to prepare the land for the famine, his family in, in Canaan would have died. But if his family would have died, then there would have been no Messiah that could be born out of a dead family. And therefore, if there was no Messiah, then we would all be left dead in our sins and without hope in the world. Are you grateful for God's plan? When you see all of that happen, like, man, because God promised Abraham, Jacob, and all these incredible people who walk by faith that, hey, your land will be a land of plenty, and you will have a lineage that will go on for eternity. And we know that the Messiah came from Abraham's line. And so if, if, if God didn't orchestrate all these things through Joseph, we ourselves would be dead in our sins. And we, that, that teaches us that we got to be so grateful. we gotta, we got to cherish the plan that God has for each and every one of us. Yeah. Let's close out in Romans chapter 8. Come on, bro. Come on, Aaron. In Romans chapter 8, in verse 28, the Bible reads, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And I hope this, this scripture inspires you this morning to know that God is working on your behalf, that God is working to do incredible things in your life. 
But the only thing that we must understand to stay in line with God's perfect plan is that you got to keep your integrity. And you ultimately have to be God-dependent. So let's leave here today, this morning, being joyful for God's plan. Let's leave here knowing that, man, God has a plan to prosper you and not to harm you. And that God has a plan to use you in a powerful, powerful way for his glory. And to God be the glory.